welcome to the Health Hacking Summit. And Hi. Wonderful. Wonderful to have you on. Last time when yeah. we had a chat, you were uh, just coming out of a sauna. Yep. I know you're a big fan. Yeah, totally. I'm actually, we've got a sauna here in LA, so definitely, st- definitely utilizing it. <laughs> Yeah, and and then you tried to come to Biohacker Summit and you broke your arm. I did. I broke my elbow. It was a huge tragedy, and I'm so excited to come to visit you guys, hopefully in August in Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah. So Dr. Molly Malouf is going to be at Biohacker Summit in Amsterdam, uh, 21st, 22nd August, and also probably also Helsinki, 16th, 17th October. So I'm stoked. She's a wealth of knowledge and information when it comes to how we can all optimize our health and well-being for the better and and she's definitely the one of the more sane ones out there looking at all <laughs> the scientific papers and and um and and rigorously looking what really works and what doesn't and i've been following also your commentary on on the uh, current coronavirus situation and uh, yeah um you personally seem to be based on your social media looking a lot mm-hmm. on mental and psychological health as well um yeah uh, uh, so i know that you've been on 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 focusing a lot on meditation and nature connection and so on can you maybe just before we jump into your presentation kind of reflect on your your experience on diving into that for the last half a year or so yeah um well the thing is is i've always been asking myself what are the first principles of health and when i really started getting into you know constantly asking why, why, why do people get sick? Why do people have mental health breakdowns? I kept on coming back to this realization that there is no true separation between mental health and physical health because they're not the same. They're not different. The brain in a dysfunctional state we're going to talk about today is usually the product of what's called allostatic load. So it's basically a brain that breaks under stress. And I look at the body as a structure, right? It's a structure and it has wiring, it has brain and it has peripheral wiring. And it, and, and these are physical things, right? That you need to maintain with a healthy diet, but you also need to maintain with the right energy supply. So, so much of my practice is dedicated to nutrition and mitochondrial health. And when I finally figured out how much neuroplasticity was truly important to prevent um, mental health breakdowns and how a lot of mental health breakdowns were related to declines in neuroplasticity, I started to implement more um, sort of cutting edge therapeutic regimens in my practice, including some stuff that is very future forward thinking and like things like ketamine assisted psychotherapy. So I've been on the forefront of psychedelic medicine and I'm going to talk a little bit about it today uh, because I think it's kind of a disservice to people to not really talk about some of the things that I see working in the field. But also, um, I wanted to just give a disclaimer that this entire talk is not medical advice. I'm not your doctor. I'm going to tell you about what I do in my practice, but it's not a replacement for your relationship with your doctor. And so these are not recommendations. This is research purposes only. And I want to let everyone know that I do consider myself on the forefront of a lot of new things that are um, sometimes off-label use. So I'm going to talk about those things today because my first and foremost recommendation to everyone is do no harm. And I think it's almost harmful not to tell people about the things that I'm seeing work versus to keep them to myself. So that's why I'm really excited to bring this to you guys today. The Biohackers Summit and everyone who's part of this biohacking community tends to be on the cutting edge. So I feel like it's going to be a a great talk to, to discuss. Absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely a renaissance when it comes to research into many of these things that we uh, abandoned in the 60s, 70s and uh, are kind of making their comeback now with with a lot of promising research that's coming out of maps and others. And um, it, it's wonderful to have doctors like you who are uh, out of traditional practice and are spending their training and uh, attention and time and effort in in studying these things and, and bringing that knowledge out there. So thank you very much for doing it. And uh, yeah, let's let's jump right into the presentation. I, I, I truly believe myself that the brain body connection is one of the most important things to pay attention to in times like this, when people get constantly bombarded by signals of stress 
and burden mm -hmm. and uh, not just, you know, media, but also the relatives, friends, all kinds of people freaking out. It's, it's, totally. uh, that is the moment you mentioned allostatic load. Uh, I would mention, um, homeostasis, like the, the natural balance of, of things uh, in medical terms or, or the equilibrium, which is kind yeah. of like where all the systems are in harmony and balance. So let's, let's jump into, uh, your presentation on, on, uh, on, on the brain and body connection. Thank you. Great. All right, so we will share screen and we'll do the keynote and we'll press play. All right, everyone. So this talk is all about biohacking neuroplasticity during COVID-19 with Dr. Molly, that's me. <laughs> so who am I, right? Who is this doctor on screen? Um, I'm a medical doctor. I work with executives, investors, entrepreneurs, and some celebrities in San Francisco and LA to help them optimize their health. And by health, I mean, the ability to adapt and self-manage in the face of adversity. So adversity right now is everywhere. It's physical, social, environmental challenges, and that's what um, I do best, is really teaching people how to thrive in the midst of chaos. Um, I'm also a media brand. I've got a website called drmolly.co, and I'm building a YouTube and online course. I'm a writer. I'm writing a book right now and a cookbook on, uh, on health and health span. Um, I'm founding a supplement company called Adaptive IQ that's um, aiming to help people adapt and self-manage right now. I also advise and consult for lots of companies. I've worked with 40 different companies in consumer health, biotech, wearable technology, you name it, I've done it. Um, I also do a lot of public speaking, and if you want to learn more about, more about my bio, check out um, my LinkedIn page. So the first part of this talk is going to be about why stress breaks the brain, and the second part of the talk is going to be about how we can try to mitigate some of the brain dysfunction by upregulating neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. So the first and foremost thing you gotta know about stress is that stress is not good or bad. Stress is a part of life. And right now we are all encountering an enormous amount of extra stress. And under this level of stress, our brains are suffering from a lot of new challenges. And these challenges, in some cases, are gonna break people. Some people are gonna thrive. My goal for you today is to give you the power to thrive in the midst of the stress. And the first thing you got to think about with stress is you got to stop calling it bad or good. You got to realize this is life. And to be a healthy human means that you will adapt and self-manage during this adversity. So um, stress can be too little. And, and this is like the kids who grow up with too much, um, maybe too, too much coddling, uh, where people actually are too fragile. That, that does happen to some people. They're not resilient if they get hit with stress. Then there's too much stress, right? There's stress that can make us less resilient. Uh, basically, if you take a person who's maybe lost their job, going through a divorce and has a death in the family, that's too much stress. And then there's a just right amount of stress, which I'm sure you guys have heard about hormesis, but this is the kind of stress that builds you stronger. Things like fasting, exercise, infrared sauna, um, you know, putting yourself under challenging environments, like these things can make you stronger. That's hormesis. But there's this theory called the generalized unsafety theory of stress. And this is something that really changed my perspective because it basically explains why a lot of us living in modern life, we do all the things that we're supposed to do to stay healthy. We're exercising, we're eating right. And, you know, we, we used to have more social interaction, but for some reason I noticed when I was living in San Francisco in the heart of the city, that I was still feeling really stressed out on a regular basis. And then I discovered this theory. And basically this idea is that there are certain aspects of life that can compromise our, our, our ability to manage stress because they give us a low level of consistent stress that adds upon all the other things we have to deal with, like work and relationships. So things like compromised bodies. If you sit at a desk all day long for 12 hours, you are compromising your body. And that is a lot of people right? Most people do not stand. I'm actually standing right now because I do not sit while I work. Compromise social networks. Um, you know, we, we're experiencing this right now, but even before the COVID-19 outbreak, a lot of people had very compromised um, communities. They weren't interacting with their family or their friends regularly, and they were isolated even before this. So now you have massive social isolation on top of compromised communities. And then there's compromised contacts, right? So before, it was like when I was living in, a, in an environment where there was a lot of noise pollution. Well, now we live in an environment where you, don't, you walk outside and you don't know who's infected with this illness. So there's a lot of these new levels of stressors that are just adding to our 
what's called allostatic load. It's the amount of burden that we can take before we start to break down. So um, the idea is that essentially like we have to send our body safety signals to reduce this generalized uncertainty. And unless you feel safe, your brain is going to be on stress alert. And when your brain's on stress alert, you actually can't maintain the normal functions of your body effectively. So people start gaining weight without eating more. People start having all sorts of metabolic dysfunctions just because they simply don't feel safe. Um, and this is likely due to the mitochondrial allostatic load burden, which, which means that if you put enough stress on, on a person and they don't feel safe, their bodies start going into an energy saving mode and their mitochondria start directing their energy towards trying to defend themselves. Um, which is not great under chronic. Um, it's not, not great if it's chronic. So what happens is you get all these different factors, right? And you get all these hits. And basically researchers grouped 100 factors associated with an increased risk of depression into 10 categories. And if you get enough hits, your body starts breaking and your brain starts to break. And so this is essentially what happens. Your, the stress of all these different things can upregulate cortisol, can, dis, can cause dysregulation of what's called your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So this is your stress axis. And what happens is your, your BDNF, your brain-derived neurotrophic factor, goes down. Your, you actually reduce the number of new neurons being created, and you reduce the number of new dendrites being created. So your body is stuck in this place where you actually can't think your way out of your problem. So when, was, when someone's depressed or anxious and you tell them, oh, just calm down, oh, you can figure this out on your own, they actually can't physically do that because their brain has less neurogenesis and less neuroplasticity in this state. So depression to me in my book is it's a failure of the ability to adapt to the allostatic load. And the consequence are these symptoms, the symptoms of sleep dysfunction, of loss of interest, of feelings of guilt and low energy, um, impaired cognition, reduced or, or greater appetite, psychomotor agitation or retardation, and suicide, unfortunately. And so I do believe that we are going to start seeing higher rates of suicide in this um, unfortunate epidemic we're dealing with. So um, the other problem with being depressed or anxious is that a lot of people perseverate. They're stuck in the ditch and they can't think their way out of it. So they're just constantly thinking, how do I, I'm in this ditch and this sucks and what do I do? And they're not able to think their way out of the problem. So what do we do, right? Well, the way that I see it is if you're in a ditch, you've got, a, you've got a two, basically two options of getting out of the ditch. The first option is you got to be able to think your way out of the situation you're in. You got to actually think, okay, how do I build some stairwell stairs out of this ditch? How do I actually build a stairwell? That's where neuroplasticity upregulation comes in. It's, it's being able to literally think your way out of the problem that you're in. The other way is you got to get someone to help you pull, it, pull you out. And that means that therapy is fundamental and having, some, having social connection and having help in the state of depression and anxiety and high stress is fundamental. So I'm going to teach you now how do you get to this place of increased neuroplasticity so you can get yourself out of this ditch that you're in. Okay, so the first thing is, is the problem is actually part of the solution, right? The problem is we're, we're isolated. Like to save our lives from getting infection and to save many people's lives, we have to socially isolate. But social isolation causes decreased BDNF in the brain. So what do you got to do, right? You have to interact with people, which means you need to call your friends. You need to call your family. You need to get a psychiatrist or a psychologist to work with in order to have social interaction right now. And if you're lucky, you have friends that have been socially isolated for as long as you have been. And you, you, I actually am recommending occasionally meeting up with people, not touching them, not physically hugging them, but literally doing social distance walking. If you have had no contact with people, you absolutely need to have some human contact. I'm sorry. It's not the same thing as going to a party. It's not the same thing as, as interacting with 10 to 15 people. It's literally going on a walk occasionally, going to the grocery store. I was in line at the grocery store and I had a really nice conversation with a random stranger and it totally brightened my day. So you need some social interaction, even if it's digital. The second thing is exercise. And I know this sounds totally ridiculous because everyone's like, oh yeah, of course I know I need to exercise. But I went three days last week without exercising 
And let me tell you, I completely felt my mental health breaking down in three days. And before that, I was exercising every single day. So I can tell you from firsthand experience that not exercising is going to cause you to have a mental health breakdown. <laughs> and I didn't have an actual breakdown, but I definitely felt myself not at all in optimal state. So exercise is your best medicine right now because exercise increases BDNF in the brain. And what I'm currently doing is basically weightlifting because, um, or, and if you don't have weights, body weight exercises and high intensity interval training. Now I am in a really good state of physical fitness. If you are new to activity, you got to start where you're at and you do not just jump into a heavy weightlifting regimen or a HIIT training regimen. But for me, these are the best ways that I increase mitochondrial biogenesis, which is producing more energy in the body, which is going to fuel more synaptic plasticity. I also do yoga and flexibility for stress reduction and for um, and just for general, you know, general health. Um, but the real fundamental thing here, you got to know, guys, is that exercise is paramount for increasing neuroplasticity. It is paramount for increasing mitochondrial biogenesis. If you want more energy and you want to be able to build new neural connections, you must exercise. And I could get into this thing called the adaptive capacity model, but basically your body's tr always trying to protect yourself and anticipate the future. So when you exercise, you're sending the signal to your body that there's, there's a demand today. And what your body says is, okay, I'm going to predict a higher demand tomorrow. So I'm going to give you the energy that you need to anticipate that demand in, in the event that you have something more difficult that you face the next day. So easier said than done. Do something that makes you come alive. Dance. Do Zoom um, workouts with friends. Join, you know, a bunch of different, try different things while you're at home. But exercise is probably the number one tip I have for you right now. Um, meditation, okay? Meditation, like exercise, you got to start where you're at. You don't just jump into a heavy meditation regimen. You start exactly where you're at and you do a little bit every day and you just learn to watch your breath and notice your breathing and notice notice how deep or shallow you're breathing and consciously just try to breathe deeper, slower breaths. It's gonna help you with panic, it's gonna help you with anxiety. Um, there's so many different types of meditation. I got really deep into meditation in the last year and I have to say, it is the best medicine for ADHD, for depression and for anxiety that I've ever found. It is absolutely life-changing. It is probably the most important medicine that I take every day. Um, I'm doing this thing called the finders course. It's a really serious meditation course, but, um, meditation increases BDNF and changes the brain. And so if you can learn to sit with discomfort and to sit with the things that make you really anxious and face them head on and be cool with whatever comes up, that is a superpower and that takes practice. So the way that I see it, meditation is subtle bodybuilding. It's something that you got to do a little bit every day and gradually you, you, you work up to higher and higher amounts. Um, it also helps you not have to resort to things like alcohol. Now, it also helps me fall asleep at night. So I'm a big, big fan of sleep. Sleep is probably the first thing that I ever started optimizing in my biohacking stack. It was many, many, many years ago when I first got into optimizing health, like nine years ago. And I looked at sleep first because I noticed that my sleep and my circadian rhythms were totally thrown off. And because it's such an important thing in my life, I almost always forget how important it is because it's like, wow, like it's, it's so, it's so valuable. But I actually got a few nights of disrupted sleep last week. And I was like, wow, you forget how important it is until you miss sleep. So if there's one thing that you do at night that you can really, really learn to, to optimize, it's turn off your screens and have a wind down routine, take a bath, get some Epsom salts if you can. If you have to resort to supplements, take melatonin or GABA. Um, this combination will put you out. But again, um, try not to resort to things like Xanax or benzodiazepines if you can. Those, those that have long-term detrimental effects on the brain. Um, that being said, if your doctor's prescribed them to you, you know, do what your doctor tells you. Um, alcohol is super disruptive to sleep. And I started drinking a little bit here and there. I got, I got drunk for the first time in a long time. Let me tell you, my aura ring told me my heart rate variability was the worst variability I have experienced in the last six months. I felt the worst I've ever felt the next day. So take it from me, firsthand experience. If you want to have good REM sleep, give up the booze, take some time away from alcohol. Um, Alcohol is what everyone's doing right now to cope. Global alcohol intake has increased 70%. People are going to have more mental disturbances the more they drink. We know this reduces neurogenesis. 
We know this shrinks your hippocampus. We also know that it's the easiest to acquire a drug. So people are using it because it works. It makes people calm. It numbs your feelings. It makes you not have to think about all the problems that you've got. Just give yourself some breaks if you're gonna drink. Give yourself a, a seven days of sobriety and you'll have a burst of your brain regenerating. Um, so really try to work in some sobriety time in the midst of your, of your increased alcohol intake. Nutrition is also fundamental, right? Now, I am lucky that I have a fridge and a freezer filled with fresh fruits and vegetables and lots of grass-fed meat and some eggs and a pantry full of nuts and seeds. That's how I like to eat. That's what makes me feel the best. I have had a little bit of candy on this, on this like journey. And every time I eat sugar, let me tell you, I feel terrible. So if you can avoid the sugar and avoid the baked goods, avoid the refined sugar, you're going to get off the glycemic roller coaster that is stressing out your brain. A lot of people are eating high fat, high sugar foods. That is the worst combination for metabolic health that you can eat. So cookies, cakes, candies, pies, pastries, pizzas, those are damaging to health. If you can give those up, you will actually thrive during this pandemic. Try to avoid self-medicating yourself with too much junk food um, because you're also gonna get vitamin deficiencies because these aren't healthy foods. You need nutrient density to, feed, to be able to actually run your metabolism effectively. I also recommend a lot more omega-3s than most people take. I'm taking four grams of omega-3s a day um, because I have found that it literally makes my brain feel like it's a different brain. So um, there's also evidence that Omega-3s are particularly good for increasing neuroplasticity, which we'll talk about later. But if not, eat fish. I, I am eating some tuna right now. Um, I know it's got mercury in it, but I need the omega-3s right now to protect my brain. Um, I am also doing intermittent fasting. Now, I have to admit, fasting has been harder during the pandemic, but if you can work your way up to 14 to 16 hours, and if you're a man, maybe 18 hours, it's a little bit easier for men to do longer fasts than women, women right now. Um, Fasting is such a great way to flip the metabolic switch, to shift your body from carb to fat metabolism, and to give your mitochondria the, the sort of, to, like the, what, what's basically toggling in and out of carb to fat metabolism. That is health span extending. That is great for the brain. And fasting is probably one of the best tips I can give you to not gain a ton of weight right now. So um, when I intermittent fast, my weight remains the same. And when I stop intermittent fasting, my weight goes up. So to me, it's like, if you want to avoid getting really fat during COVID-19, you better start intermittent fasting. Again, though, I'm not your doctor. This is something you need to ease yourself into. Start with what, where you're at. If you're only, if you're only, you know, basically if you're, if you're, um, if you can get to 12 hours of intermittent fasting, that's even good too. Just try not to be eating 24 um, seven. You don't need three meals a day. You don't need breakfast. It's a lie that's been perpetuated by Kellogg's and a bunch of, you know, food companies. So if you want, skip breakfast or eat an early dinner, but try to limit your timing of your food. Um, and then also try to eliminate so much snacking because most of what we're snacking on is crap food, right? We're processed foods. We don't want those. Those are what, those are, those are what causes disease. Um, supplements. All right. I love supplements. Plenty of doctors think supplements are crap. I personally take supplements every day. Whether you do or not, this is totally up to you and your doctor to decide what works for you. However, I would be doing you harm if I didn't share with you all the research that I did on supplements for enhancing health during a pandemic. Um, I don't think we need to wait for every single clinical trial to come out to make recommendations. But that being said, these aren't recommendations. This is just research purposes only. So personally, I take CBD. Um, CBD has got a lot of evidence that it enhances neuroplasticity. Also, evidence there's evidence for neuroplasticity in curcumin from turmeric. Omega-3s, as I've mentioned, green tea. I'm a huge fan of matcha, specifically the brand Breakaway Matcha. If you are into matcha, this company will change your life. Um, I'm about to do some videos with them soon. Um, quercetin is a phenomenal supplement. Um, so all of these things enhance neuroplasticity. But P.S., they also have evidence for viral infections. But I can't tell you that because the FDA will shut me down. So <laughs> anyway, um, this is, my, this is my current supplement regimen with links to purchase if you choose. I am an Amazon associate. I'm just, I, I figured everyone was asking me about supplements to take right now, so I had to tell them what I'm taking. And so I decided to help people rather than hold back the data that I found. And it took a lot of research. And I talked to a lot of doctors and researchers all over the globe to find out what are people taking right now. And this is the best list I found. All right, now for the really controversial stuff. So... 
I spent a year and a half in diligence on ketamine assisted therapy. I went to a conference for doctors called the American Society of Ketamine Physicians. And I went and literally met all the leading people in the field of ketamine assisted psychotherapy because I noticed that there was a wave of new novel treatments coming to the forefront of mental health that actually had some really exciting research behind them. And why I'm so excited about um, ketamine assisted psychotherapy is that we are discovering that psychedelics are psychoplastogens, which means they increase neuronic growth and spine density and, syn and synaptogenesis. What does that mean? That means that we are now learning that the careful use of the right doses of psychedelics can increase neuroplasticity in the brain. Now, these are, for the most part, aside from ketamine, illegal substances. Ketamine actually is a approved substance in America for depression. Like the company Johnson & Johnson got this uh, formula called S-ketamine approved for the treatment for treatment resistant depression. So in my practice, I started seeing patients with treatment resistant depression and I learned at a bunch of conferences for doctors that you could prescribe sublingual ketamine assisted psychotherapy, which means that you give people um, what's called trochies that give them a therapeutic experience without having to use IVs or needles. And then you combine that with psychotherapy. So what I've discovered in my practice is that some people have amazing responses to their depression with this medicine. Some people have no response at all and hate the experience. But the people who do respond have transfor transformed their lives. So I'm not telling people to go out and find a bunch of ketamine and take it because frankly, the stuff on the street is very dirty and mixed with all sorts of stuff you don't want to take. But I am saying that in LA and in San Francisco and in other cities throughout the country, there are doctors that are prescribing sublingual ketamine to help treat treatment resistant depression because frankly, it's one of the only drugs we have for suicide prevention. And in emergency rooms right now, doctors are being allowed, to, even at Kaiser Permanente, to prescribe intramuscular and IV ketamine to abort suicidal depression. So if somebody is actively suicidal, I want them to know that they can go to an emergency room and they can get an infusion almost always these days if they ask for it. And I'm not saying everyone should go do that, but I am saying that there's, we are going to see some suicide uh, rates go up. The research seems to suggest that social isolation is going to reduce more deaths from suicide is going to reduce more deaths from, from COVID-19 than suicide would, than, than if we didn't social, socially isolate. Um, so I'm trying to frame this correctly. So if we didn't socially isolate, um, we would see a lot of COVID-19 deaths. So we have to socially isolate. But social isolation is going to increase suicide. But the number of people that it's going to increase suicide is definitely not going to be the same amount as if we didn't socially isolate. So social isolation is necessary right now, but we have to keep in mind the mental health breakdowns that are going to come from job loss, from all the other things that are going to happen, divorces that are going to happen from people socially interacting in their home that haven't seen each other as much as they're seeing each other. So I'm just mentioning this because this is something that I'm using in my practice and I'm seeing really amazing results with people. Um, the future. Okay. So Right now, there are 50 different clinical trials for psilocybin and other psychedelic-assisted therapies. There are, the, if you haven't learned about this, check out the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies because they're running trials on MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD. I think we're going to see a lot of PTSD from COVID-19, and I think it's important to talk about the future. And the future is, I believe that someday we are going to be able to get microdosed um, Microdosed psilocybin from magic mushrooms and microdosed LSD. Um, it's going to be a pharmaceutical drug and it's going to be dispensed by doctors and pharmacies. This is not where we're at right now. People are currently taking this into their own hands. I can't recommend that right now because it's really hard to source these things and effectively dose them on your own. However, if you are interested in learning more about microdosing, check out Third Wave. My friend Paul Austin has done a ton of research in the space. Um, and, you know, keep up with maps and watch the documentary Fantastic Fungi with Paul Stamets and learn about these things that are coming because I think it's important to talk about the future. And if you want to get in touch with me and want to talk to me about whatever it is that you're interested in learning more about or anything that you saw in this 
topic, please uh, follow me on Instagram or Twitter, find me on LinkedIn, check out my website or email me at any of these emails. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I have a quick question. Um, so you mentioned that social isolation is something that uh, might drive perhaps people uh, to commit more likely suicide and have me more mental issues. Um, just, you know, your kind of prediction or estimation, like how many people who are now put inside their room, basically sent into their room, thinking about their life, are actually going to wake up. And actually it's going to be a positive change to their life that they finally realize that the work they've been doing is not necessarily something they should be doing for the rest of their lives. That it's a happy moment that they, you know, had to spend these last couple of months indoors. Um, I mean, there is so many, many people who, you know, do yoga and they uh, voluntarily uh, contract themselves into a cocoon and start thinking about their lives. And, you know, there's this whole classical idea of some kind of yogi going to the mountains alone in a cave. So not that every one of us need to do that, like kind of what, what's your take on that one? Well, I personally spent many, many months prior to this outbreak alone in Maui, going inward, working remotely. Weirdly, it prepared me deeply for this experience. And honestly, the time I spent alone going inward was by far the best thing I've ever, the best gift I've ever given myself. Because sometimes you need to remove yourself from your normal life in order to get perspective. And I think everything in life is about perspective. And if you see this as an opportunity for post-traumatic growth instead of post-traumatic stress, then oftentimes your intentions come true. So if you, if you take this experience and you say, I intend for this to make me stronger, more resilient, more powerful, more aligned with my values and my purpose, and more aware of how I can help the world, then you're gonna come out of this actually with flying colors. The problem is that a lot of people have never really given themselves the gift of going inward. So it's really a decision you have to make that you are going to spend this time really figuring out who you are and getting to know yourself. And I actually have a bunch of personal development workbooks that I'd be happy to provide a link to in the show notes um, that I've collected over many years. And every, at the beginning of every year, I spend a solid day or two filling out all of these questions to ask myself about where I'm going, who am I and why. And I don't think a lot of people ask themselves these things. They, they just kind of go and get into their general flow of life and they wake up in these like, you know, unhappy jobs and unhappy marriages. And they're like, well, where did 10 years of my life go? And part of that's because they've lacked self-reflection. So I had this epiphany last night when I was listening to a podcast with Max Lugavere and this doctor, the psychiatrist from New York. And he was basically saying like, you know, this, this is a crisis, but um, there's a lot of opportunity in crisis. And for me, I'm pretty lucky. I'm actually working on a ton of projects right now that are making me jump out of bed in the morning. And I'm very, very fortunate that I have a deep sense of purpose. But if you don't have a deep sense of purpose, this is the perfect time to figure out what that is. And the way that you go about that is you start thinking about the things that make you come alive. And you start thinking about what are your core values. And when you start really thinking about the things that light you up and the things that make you excited about the future, that's when you start moving in a direction of, of your real deepest purpose. And so, um, you know, the, the, the uh, organization called Esalen Institute was, the, uh, it was basically where the human potential movement started. And Alan Watts worked there, Andrew Weil worked there, Hunter S. Thompson was the gatekeeper at one point. And basically every one of my heroes of any counterculture movement had started out there. So they've got a ton of amazing resources on their website. And um, I just really offer you this opportunity to also develop a spiritual practice and a devotional practice in some way. Like, you know, it's, you, you really, there's always been this sort of paradigm of the mind, body, and the spirit. And I think a lot of people have, have never really, or maybe not in recent times, given themselves the opportunity to actually develop a spiritual sense of self. And you know, whether or not you go towards religion or go towards even stoicism, um, there's room for having a belief that there's a reason to have hope and faith for a better future. So that's what I'll leave you with. Oh, wonderful. I, I totally agree on, 
on your take on that. Um, personally, one of the most transformative experiences for me was basically spending about two months, 60 days in isolation on a piece of rock, pretty much alone. And uh, I just had the book uh, Be Here Now from Ram Das. Yes. <laughs> yes. So that totally. was, uh, yeah, I, I really, um, um, I long for that experience. It's, um, it, it, it changed a lot of things. And I can hardly recommend also the Netflix documentary Going Home by Ram yes. Das, which is just about, you know, when he was about to die, like his reflections on death. And it's so beautiful. Um, yeah. He puts everything. And uh, sometimes when, I mean, that's that kind of stems from uh, a lot of people who are going through uh, near-death experience uh, where psychedelic um, medicines are studied, like psilocybin. Mm-hmm. I'll take a deal with their imminent end and um, how, how beautiful people can transform that kind of experience. And I think in life, some of the most important experiences are actually not easy, fruitful, you know, reaching your yeah. goals, doing all those cool, fun things. Uh, but it's sometimes those most challenging experiences you can have, which are actually the ones that will teach you most and will help you to grow as a human being. So that's kind of where the true resilience comes from, isn't it? Yeah. I'm just going to add that Ram Dass has a beautiful recording with my friend who's a DJ, um, DJ Justin Beretta. It's called Imagine. And if you're ever really struggling at night and you really need to have some soothing music, I, I listen to this track. I probably listened to it hundreds of times. Because really Ram Dass's message was just be love. Just you are deep down just love. And he, when he passed, right before he passed, people asked him, Ram Dass, why are you going? Why are you going to leave us? Like, we, we need you right now. And he said, because I have everywhere to be now. And I just get chills whenever I think of that. I was actually in Maui. Um, I was going to meet him before he died, but I was in a meditation retreat. And when I got out of the retreat, I found out he had passed. But I was able to meet a man um, who runs this place called The Death Store. His name is Bodhi, um, Bodhi B. And he, and Ram Dass was on his board of directors. And I actually did, I'm going to be posting an interview with him soon all about death. But one of the things that we are learning through this epidemic is that it's forcing us to face our mortality. And that's scary, right? But if you can face your mortality head on and be like, okay, this is coming and I can handle this and I'm going to use this as fuel to live a better and more purposeful, purposeful life, then you can actually thrive in the face of this. Um, I really love Carlos Castaneda and his work um, all about this. Like, If you haven't read any Castaneda, he really is one of the first writers who really brought me to a place of peace of my own death and my own mortality. So I, I recommend his books. But um, yeah, like... This is such a this is such an opportunity, and um, it sounds crazy to put it like that, but it really is if you think about it. Absolutely, I mean, there's the Tibetan book of the death, which yeah. is uh, one of the key books that the Harvard researchers were looking at when they were first studying uh, the, the psychedelic medicines. So, so yeah, there's there's a great promise uh, right in this moment to to figure out like what's your relationship with um, uh, every single passing moment. And I already see it in, in people like um, uh, I I get friends who I haven't been in contact with for 10, 15, 20 years. Maybe they were childhood friends who are contacting me and, you know, sending me something like that. They're grateful that they experienced like 20 years ago or something like this. And it's like, whoa, people suddenly have so much time to be grateful. And this whole practice of gratitude, that you are grateful for every passing moment and every experience and every human being you, you came across and what you learned from them, that's, um, that, that is something that every one of us can do right now. It's maybe maybe you know a tip for everyone out there is to reach out to someone who you haven't really been in contact with and uh, who you're thankful for some experience and, you know, send your gratitude for what you experienced uh, with them maybe sometime. Um, now, now that we all have that because, um, opportunity, because maybe that opportunity will pass, uh, who knows? So with that, thank you very much, do, uh, Dr. Molly Malouf, and um, for, for your words. And uh, so when, if people want to follow 
your work? Like, where should they go? Um, well, maybe we can post the the last. We can post the the presentation in the show notes. Um, on the last slide, I mentioned um, Instagram at drmolly.co, Twitter at Molly Maloof MD, LinkedIn Molly Maloof MD. Um, my website is drmolly.co, D R M O L L Y dot C O, and my email um, m Maloof at gmail.com, M M A L O O F at gmail or stanford.edu. Wonderful. And I can also say that um, Molly has great podcast episodes all around the internet. Oh, yeah. Um, iTunes. Yeah. Yeah. She There's a bunch of, I mean, I've done so many podcasts. Um, I try to post most of them on, on my press and media page, but I'll be updating it soon because I've done a lot more in the last few months. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much for this. And uh, yeah, we'll continue the show now. Cool. Thank you so much.